Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 25th annual um, academic at Seton Hall University, named after former uh, chemistry professor Matthew Petershine. Uh, this is the year 2021 and um, in the 21st century. Uh, I say that because the focus of our attention are going to be two heroes of international posture from the 20th century, uh, Nelson Mandela and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, the inspiration behind the honoring of these two men would lie in the concept that um, no man, we could say, is an island unto himself. And we think the scope of these two men covers the entirety of the globe in the sense of uh, their impact, their values, uh, the commitment, and they present themselves as role models to all of us. Um, as a part of what we do over the next uh, two hours, we're going to be having uh, various presentations done, uh, which will be honoring um, the spirit of these two men. Uh, we'll be starting with a, somewhat of an overview of their lives uh, and their impact. Uh, that this will be followed by um, students from Seton Hall University uh, who will be doing presentations, which in the spirit of global social justice, um, students will be looking at, uh, for example, Catholic perspectives on social justice and how that would apply to all of us as we look around the world today. Uh, we'll be looking at current issues that would be troubling and, and, and bothersome for all of us. Uh, recent uh, hate crimes against the Asian American uh, population. Uh, this will then be followed by several faculty members who will share with us the type of work they're doing within their disciplines, uh, which will yield um, an emphasis upon diversity, equity, and inclusion values. Uh, I am, once again, the Reverend Dr. Forrest Pritchard. Uh, for those who may be unfamiliar with me, I just would like to mention <laughs> While I've been at Seton Hall for 42 years, um, prior to that, I spent nine years at two other universities. And prior to that, I started my um, baccalaureate education uh, at the historically uh, black Delaware State University in 1961. Uh, this was one year after the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, was formed at um, in North Carolina. But the reason I want to mention that is that on this Sunday afternoon, uh, one of the uh, lieutenants or associates of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, we will have him on our campus and he will be presenting a presentation on uh, applying the nonviolent principles of Dr. King, as well as Gandhi, uh, to the world of the 21st century. Pleased to have with us uh, the Reverend Dr. Bernard Lafayette from the, the uh, Selma Center for Nonviolence, Truth and Reconciliation. He will be joining us. I, I have the pleasure of interviewing him and then he will walk all of us through the Kingian approach uh, to nonviolence. Um, if you are interested in this event, please go to the Seton Hall University website, uh, access the uh, university calendar and uh, look by date, look for Sunday, May the 2nd, look through the various events, you will see the event and you may register that way. We look forward to having you there. Uh, so with all of that being said, I would um, just like as I reflect, uh, Dr. Lafayette, um, one year before I entered college, um, he was one of the founding members along with people like John Lewis, Ian Nash, Julian Bond, they were the formers and founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And the relationship that the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee will have with this presentation for Dr. King. Um, in 1960, Dr. King had dispatched uh, his director of operations, who was Ella Baker, one of those Hong Sung female heroes of the civil rights movement. He asked her to go into the South and to uh, get students from all of the historically black colleges uh, together in an assembly so that they might become a student organization under his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 
Um, at the meeting, you know, uh, Ms. Baker basically instructed the students that uh, youth must determine their own destiny. So you can walk behind all of these ministers or you can walk by their sides or you can walk ahead of them. And many of the students who were present, although I was not there, I was just a probably a, um, a junior in high school, perhaps. But uh, many of the students decided that the pathway to their destiny uh, was to form their own separate organization. And rather than demonstrating a lot, uh, they thought that going into the South, empowering people through the act of teaching them how to read and how to write and understand their constitutional rights. Uh, would be the pathway to excellence, uh, to do tutoring and, and to reinforce a positive self-imagery. So I share that uh, with you all. We invite you to join us also on um, Sunday evening at uh, 6.30 p.m. Let's take a brief look at uh, these men, and I will try to uh, refresh our memories of them, but then to fill in the gaps for those who know uh, very little about them other than the fact that they both um, emerged as um, uh, activists for social justice. You know, most people, for example, when they think about Dr. King, they really only think about <laughs> and remember one thing, and that's the speech that was made in Washington, D.C. in 1963. I call that like, in a sense, a one dimensional understanding. So through our efforts, we ought to attempt to uh, present hopefully a three dimensional understanding. While both of these men um, were in the public light as civil rights activists, you know, they were also fathers, they were husbands, uh, they were also leaders in uh, of organizational um, entities. So without further ado, let's take a look. Um, Nelson Mandela was known affectionately in South Africa by a folk name, you might say like a nickname, but it's within the African tradition um, versus a Western tradition where most people would know us by our full formal names. There's a tradition within Africa to relabel, to rename um, significant individuals. So his name among the people was Madiba. Um, Madiba had been a um, a tribal chief from the um, Transki people from the 18th century. And um, so that's the way they honored his spirit. When, when Mandela died in December, uh, a few years back, immediately people would go into the streets to shout affirmations uh, to the greatness of his spirit. And they thank God for uh, allowing Madiba uh, to be with us the time that he was. Um, we contrast that with the way in which in the Western world people would want to honor a Mandela. They would probably want to wait, you know, a few weeks or months uh, since he died in December. Uh, people were even suggesting to me, why don't we wait until February to honor him? And I said, no, the African in all of us would say that we should shout the affirmations to God uh, uh, immediately to just acknowledge uh, the man who was with us. You know, Mandela was in prison from the years 1962 to 1990. I want you to think about that. I mean, how many of us could survive in the human spirit uh, for that period of time? Uh, while he was there, he wrote a secret autobiography. The contents of all of his prison writings were published in a book called A Long Walk to Freedom. That book was published in 1994. Um, he will always be remembered, I believe, obviously, for his key role in being steadfast. You know, he was a lawyer by training. And um, he also was a, a member of, uh, and if you would, a, uh, we could say a civil rights organization within the country. But also the government declared that organization at some point illegal. They began to uh, call them all kinds of bad names. Uh, like activists, radical, and so forth, but um, they persisted. Um, he died at the age of uh, 95 on December the 5th in 2013. One of the
things that many people may not be aware of is that, you know, his release from prison uh, was actually influenced not by the fact that he had completed his term, but he it was influenced by the emergence throughout the world of a global response of injustice against him. Uh, many of us uh, were active uh, for decades in what was called the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, there were a couple of demands. One was to have him released and all of his colleagues um, from that prison, but also we were asking for worldwide corporations and specifically American corporations to disinvest themselves from any operations in South Africa um, and to return those jobs you know, to America. What many people may not be aware of was that the South African government um, actually in order to lure uh, corporations to South Africa, they actually could promise everyone that if you come and do business here and set up your operations, we can guarantee you that you can almost double your profits. Now, how can any country guarantee any manufacturer or corporation that they can do that? Well, it's rather simple in one sense, in that uh, because they still had the remnant of a, what they call the colored population. So in South Africa, you had the Afrikaners, who would be members of the Dutch Reformed Church, who many um, a century or more earlier had uh, migrated to that land after having left Europe, looking for a place in which they could uh, plant their roots uh, and have a little bit more religious respect than they were receiving in Europe. And uh, they wanted to have a place they could call their own homeland. So they went there and started killing if you would, through warfare, the um, the people of uh, what would be called later South Africa. I might also point out, um, for those who are unfamiliar with that area of the country and those events uh, of the incursion and the invasion, that's where such um, cultural heroes emerged, such as Shaka Zulu. Among the Zulu people, a Shaka uh, would be, have been considered a general. So it was Shaka who organized um, tens upon thousands of um, Zulu warriors into an army um, uh, to stop that, uh, stop that evasion. Uh, they were highly successful initially when they had smaller numbers of men uh, with hand uh, weapons, pistols, and the Africans were using uh, hand spears and very, very large um, shields um, that would protect the entire body. So these shields could stand five foot tall and might be uh, two and a half feet wide. So the African warriors would stand behind it. Uh, they, these, these were very thick so that they would be protected. Then they would reach around with their weapons to strike a blow. Um, and they were highly successful in their initial encounters with these invaders. It's only when the invaders uh, ultimately began to, if you would, up their game, they came back with machine guns and other heavy artillery, and um, the Zulu army was defeated. Um, so we share that little piece of history with you in case anyone was unfamiliar with it. Um, but Mandela um, had used and his prim you know, primarily his legal skills for most of that time. Uh, when he was released from prison, uh, Mandela set many national goals. And this is where I think the concept of global justice. Mandela, um, um, well, I started to also mention, how could any country guarantee uh, increased profitability? And, and I started, I talked about the Zulu incursion and their defense of the nation. But ultimately, once they had been subdued, the mechanism by which the South African government, known as the Afrikaners, uh, utilized was, uh, was basically the enslavement of um, the African uh, peoples. The largest ethnic group there were the Zulu. And um, um, the South Africans were able to put those men into mine, gold mines. Uh, they would go into the gold mines, stay in a, three weeks at a time, if you were a white supervisor, you could come up 
uh, every three hours and change shifts so that the contaminants in the air would not bother your lungs. And um, but the uh, the black uh, mine workers were chained in these gold mines so that uh, gold productions within about 10 years, um, they were able to amass as much gold as we had in America in our Fort Knox reserves very quickly. And the other thing was because um, of that system of apartheid and the separation of the races, uh, the wages that would be paid normally to workers would be lower uh, in any type of industry. So therefore, when your company would switch to uh, your operations to South Africa, you automatically were guaranteed a cheap supply of labor, uh, which almost resembles what we had hundreds of years ago on the American plantation system. Um, so you mentioned that. But one of the goals that Mandela developed upon uh, leaving the prison and being elected president, and many people are totally unaware of this, he thought one of the most decent things to do for those who have been so deprived of, an, of, a, um, of a, a normal existence, um, living in, they were living in shanty villages. The shanty would be something that you simply could put up with leftover metal and pieces of wood and cardboard. Mandela set a goal to build one million houses for the colored population. In order to accomplish this, he had to call in international partners. Uh, so places like even the Ford Foundation became involved in the process. And that process continues to this very day. So we thought we would share, uh, once again, uh, some things about both of these men that very few people even knew. So now I'm gonna turn to Dr. King just for a, a moment to mention the following. Um, one of the things that many people are unaware of is that he was not born Martin Luther King, he was born Michael uh, King Jr. His father was Michael King Sr. Uh, but on one occasion, his father had traveled um, for purposes of growth and probably um, and I went to look at the theological roots of the emergence of the Protestant faith. In that journey uh, into Europe and, and into Germany, um, Dr. King's father uh, learned of the great significance and importance of the German theologian Martin Luther. Uh, he is, Martin Luther becomes the father of the Protestant Reformation. Um, that great outcry against the uh, traditions and the theologies and the doctrines of the Roman uh, faith, Roman church. Uh, the great Catholic institutions uh, of Europe. And in speaking out, as many of you remember, Martin Luther, the, the, the theologian, developed 95 different uh, critical statements against uh, the Catholic Church. And uh, we know that today as the 95 Theses. And um, therein, while Luther eventually loses his life because of that effort, uh, the Protestant faith is born as an act of protest against the domineering influence of the self-centered influence as pro projected by Martin's, Martin Luther's analysis of that church. For example, the one example uh, we could call the mine would be the whole concept of, of um, when one prays, and one has committed a sin, one could go to a, uh, a priest and in order to have your uh, sins absolved, you could give a tribute um, to uh, some type of a payment, a donation to the church, and um, then your, your sins become absolved. So that um, uh, Martin Luther thought, you know, that uh, in today's world, the, the believer and have a direct relationship with God and does not need to go through an intercessor. So uh, Daddy King returns to America and he's so impressed with the work of Martin Luther uh, that he immediately uh, decides to change his own name legally to Martin Luther King Sr. And he also changes the name of his five-year-old son to Martin Luther King Jr. So I just thought I would share that as a means of opening up our program uh, today. 
something you did not know, hopefully, about those two men and the nature of apartheid in South Africa. Okay, we are now going to move into our first presentation of the um, of the morning. Uh, we have representatives from the Martin Luther King Scholar Association who have put together a presentation that we will share with you right now. We'll be asking those two presenters to identify themselves for you in terms of their year at school, um, uh, their majors, where they are from, and anything else they wish to share before they start the presentation. So thank you very much. We will now transition to the scholar presentations. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Amber Aragon. I am a freshman and I'm part of the Martin Luther King Scholarship Association. I'm also going to be um, representing as the president of the organization as well. And I am from Dover, New Jersey, and my major is political science. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Shirley. I'm also going to be representing the Martin Luther King Scholars Association. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and I'm a criminal justice major. All right, so today we'll be presenting to you all Saints and Social Justice, presented by both of us. So today our inspiration of our lecture, or our topic for today, is a text written by Brandon Vo, where it discusses a life lesson by discussing prominent saints, which is called The Saints and Social Justice, A Guide to Changing the World. So this is the book that our presentation will be based on as inspiration. And overall, we're going to talk about today the key themes of um, Christianity teaching. My apologies. Oh, sorry. OK, so the first one will be life dignity and community, rights and responsibility, poor and vulnerable, and care for creation. So we're going to talk a little bit about the push and pull between religion and social justice, especially in modern times. Um, there's this preconceived notion that religion and social justice issues cannot be um, intertwined, that you cannot be a very religious person and also be a very uh, justice forward person, someone who really focuses on social justice. Um, we believe this is incorrect, and we're going to use some of these themes and some of these saints to explain some of these ideas and give some examples. So we just wanted to open up the conversation to you all attending here today. And have you ever experienced this push and pull within yourselves? If you would like to use the chat function to um, respond to this. And I'll just say something from personal experience. I know, especially in modern times, um, with modern politics and everything, there's this notion that people who are the true Christians are on one side, which I believe is not true. Um, and there's a lot of people who will hide behind religion and use it to try to justify beliefs that we wouldn't necessarily hold ourselves using religion as a means of justifying it. A lot of people say they're pro-life and they don't care about issues like health care and the poor and the vulnerable and things like that. So. I think that there's a lot of things where the traditional norms of religion and social justice issues where people have had their opinions about it before that we can change and really show that you can both be really religious and you can follow your faith and also care about these social justice issues. Because I believe if we follow the Bible and other holy books teachings, then those would want us to focus on these social justice issues. All right, moving on. So the first concept will be, to, or the first key theme we'll be talking about is life, dignity, and community. All right, so this is um, Mother Teresa and of Calcutta, and she devoted her life to others and helping the poor, sick, and dying, especially in an area like Calcutta, 
it's a lot of population and there's a lot of people who are living under extreme poverty that a lot of us couldn't even imagine. And she dedicated her entire life to helping these people. And she basically gave up a lot of her life and different worldly possessions and things like that to just go and help these people in Calcutta. Um, being part Indian, it's an interesting person to hear about and learn about because she went somewhere that she really had no need to go. And she felt like she was called herself. It wasn't anyone had forced her to go there. And she, on a daily basis, consistently gave everything she had to help these people who had next to nothing and helped make their lives a little bit more inhabitable. Now, Blessed Anne-Marie, jo I can't pronounce your last name properly. Um, jo Javohi. Javohi. Okay, there we go. Blessed Anne-Marie Jehovi. Javohi. She worked hard to solve, to try to solve a lot of different issues. Um, she was one of the first women missionaries, and she did different things in politics so that she could, like, try to help disenfranchise people through that. One of her biggest things was helping free slaves in certain areas. And she even built schools um, for slaves in Sierra Leone. And her biggest thing is she would do a lot of these bigger initiatives, not so much going out and helping people like that, but charities, microfinance projects, and different things where she would try to build real institutions that she could help the disenfranchise through. And we have another question for you all. And we just want to ask, what does dignity mean to you looking at these um, at these um, prominent figures in religion? I think so through. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, th I think throughout this whole presentation with all of our different saints and everything, you can see like a great deal of dignity in all of them because everyone in their own ways have like basically sacrificed whatever they had or could have had in their lives for the greater good and to help other people. And it wasn't a part of anything else other than just strictly wanting to do it for themselves. So I think there's a great deal of dignity with pretty much everyone we're learning about. I definitely agree with that and showing respect for others. And also within the chat, we had someone say having self-respect, which is also a great answer. Our next one is going to be rights and responsibility. Which we'll... So I'll be talking about St. Thomas More. He is, says that we're all responsible for upholding our rights of others. And this is important because in his background, he wanted to be a lawyer and it's people told him he should not be. However, he did become a lawyer and he helped in the fight for fairness. Um, he also mentioned that um, doing the right thing can also have consequences. So he, when he was fighting for these um, this fairness, that sometimes he did get some um, backlash. So even though it may cause discomfort and pain and standing up for rights can be positive in the end. And I would just like to connect this with politics today and how to show that you can still be involved in politics or justice in general and still believe in your faith. It can go hand in hand that this constant push and pull that we talked about before can be present within you. However, it is possible to do both. And we can, oh, I just want to mention, you can also see this today when we're men, when we people are going against the status quo of traditional norms and so you can still practice your religion and change the way that you believe is not fair. I wanted to bring up this small sermon from Dr. King, as it is the Mandela King Symposium. Um, Dr. King was a devoted Christian and he had speeches and sermons. He used his faith to guide him and he found courage in God to get him through these challenging times of the civil rights movement. And it's important that I bring up this sermon that specifically from 1957 is um, based on the book of Matthew, which is, yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization, love even for enemies. And the sermon is called Love Your Enemies. This is important because even though some people may be on a different side than you, it's important to love them despite everything and because we are all part of God's creations.
and therefore it is our responsibility to be nice to one another. All right, our next way I wanted to talk about, or we want to talk about, is poor and vulnerable. This is the servant of God, Dorothy Day. She is more one of the modern um, political figures that we have. Um, she worked in workers' rights, which was very important. And her life shows the power of nonviolent demonstration for labor rights, inducing people of the church. So as you can see in the picture of the stained glass, of the stained glass windows, um, the Catholic worker away with war, she was always politically engaged. However, she was also able to find God in her life. Uh, she was also known for working in, with um, Cesar Chavez and the United Farmers Worker, even at the age of 75. And um, she was also a founder of the Committee of Catholics to Fight Anti-Semitism. So these are just different, different major political movements throughout her lifetime that she was engaged in. And she was also a holy woman. And one of her important quotes that she mentions or spoke about is, if I have achieved anything in life, it is because I have not been embarrassed to talk about God. And that is really important that she was able to have her faith and also be politically engaged. Next one is going to be care for creation. All right, so St. Giles was known as the um, hermit saint. Or it's like he has that name sort of like thrown around with his name. If you go in and research him more, Hermit will come up a lot. He really helped a lot with people who were disabled and um, crippled people, especially like his biggest thing that he worked with. He was a Greek saint, but he um, he worked with a lot of people who had dealt with leprosy and spent a lot of time around lepers. So if you know anything about the time period, leprosy was treated really horribly by society and lepers were looked down on by society. Um, you can almost draw some parallels to the um, AIDS outbreak from back in, I believe, the 80s around that time and the reaction from the nation. But the lepers were treated horribly and they were often outcast in cities with only lepers and only living with people who have the disease as well. And St. Giles would spend his time with these people and help these people. Um, he's now known as the patron saint for cripples and crippled people. And um, that's what, when we're talking about um, all of the creation a lot of people turn their backs on the people who do have disabilities and do have issues like that. Meanwhile, St. Giles would not do that. He saw um, land as a gift from God, meaning to be shared and cultivated. So everything he did was really trying to help everyone. It's sort of this idea of the greater good and helping out everyone in the community, regardless of their conditions. As we near the end, we wanted to bring all these important prominent figures and bring it back to social justice today, which is very important to today's society. And we wanted to bring this up. So I wanted to talk about a very important subject, which is Ireland, the country of Ireland. And I wanted to just show that it was 78.31%, which means that the majority of the country still practices Catholicism due to the um, Irish census. and yet they are able to have major social justice movements within their country and they are and this is modern day so that this is um not religion is not a barrier there's some large movements within ireland that i wanted to reference um the right to an abortion which is um a very debated topic and it was actually passed in 2018 and another current fight that they're fighting is the pres the right to preserve the native irish language so this is two important movements and that they were able to gather together and um, make a d change in their country. This is a short video. Um, let's see if it'll play. And this talks a little bit more quickly about the Northern Ireland fight for the native language, as I mentioned before, and how it brings them together as a country. We are that we are entitled to the same rights and services um, and resources and support as Welsh speakers in Wales or Gaelic speakers in Scotland or Irish speakers uh, in the south of Ireland. That we're not a, a, you know, a place apart in terms of language rights.
Here it's very much the language of community. It's very much the language of, you know, uh, of, of social organizing. It's very much the language of, uh, of resilience as well, of a community that, you know, consider themselves marginalized and excluded and, and use the Irish language and talk the Irish language to put their best foot forward and very much word as that badge of identity. All right. So that was just a quick video to show that it did bring them together in social justice movements, despite that they are they are mainly religious. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, All right. And then I just wanted to talk about the bridge reform and how we using those who came before us to learn and improve our own lives and the understanding in our faith and our political beliefs. So as I, as I mentioned before, bringing them together and learning from our saints beforehand, how we can engage in, so, in social justice today. And we just wanted to thank you and I'll pass it on to Adam. Thank you for ev everyone for coming and watching our presentation. Um, I hope you learned something new today and learned something about a saint that maybe you've heard of them before and didn't know a little bit of the backstory on them, or maybe you've just never heard of them before. Um, throughout history, we've had a lot of figures that we can go back to, and especially with the Mandela King Symposium, we can look back to Dr. King and Nelson Mandela and look at both of their lives. But like Amber was just saying, we can keep going back and reliving the past and past experiences and continue talking about them and learning from them so that we can prevent these things from happening again. Because there's still countries all over the world, including our own, that are plagued with so many social justice issues. But the biggest thing we can do is not only learn about the present, but learn about the past so that we can take the teachings of some of these great, incredible people who have really changed our world for the better. And we can apply those teachings to our lives and our society. So again, I thank everyone else um, for coming and joining and listening to us. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I'm going to check the um, chat box over here. Dr. Pritchett says, most people use the word saint to refer to someone who is exceptionally good or holy. In the Catholic Church, however, um, a saint has a more specific meaning, and it's someone who's led a life of heroic virtue. Um, I know that there's, I don't know exactly what the, the boundaries are, what the exact um, conditions are to become a saint. I don't know, Dr. Pritchard, if you know a little bit more about that, but um, I don't know what the bar really is. Right. We can explore that a little later, but no, I can, I will, I will mention this. It is a long formalized process. The, the procedures were set uh, together hundreds of years ago so that it would take, um, an extensive period of time, but it's a very formalized procedure. It does not happen quickly. I would probably say it would be uh, if it took 30 to 40 years, that might be the um, the average amount of time. I've never looked at that carefully that way, but I, I would I'm, challenge I'm, you to. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, Adam, I would challenge you to look up the history of the devil's advocate on the looking up how the Catholic Church uh, uh, looked up, uh, did sainthood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would challenge all of us to, in a sense, focus in on the concept of heroic virtue, which can be applicable uh, to all of us. You know, we um, we're on a journey in life. And the question may be, are we human beings having uh, a, uh, a spiritual journey or are we spiritual beings on a human journey? We're not going to answer that question, but it's for all of us to ponder in our own space. But I think the whole concept of heroic virtue, uh, what are the virtues that are manifested in uh, the human experience? And how do we all emerge as heroes or heroines along the way? So thank you all very much. I hope that uh, not only has this been informative, but I hope it stimulates all of us to become uh, introspective and to determine um, how we can probably uh, make this world a better place to live in right now. I'm pleased to now transition to our next presentation. As we all know, um, the world has gotten to be a very unique place over the last 13 months or so. 
relative to the COVID virus. Um, in the context that in one sense, we were all concerned about the pandemic virus, which was in the air. And then I'll also say that as it began to exacerbate or um, make all of us live in relationships, which were becoming a little bit tighter, some of uh, we were socially restricted. Now, and there's no way in the world that under those circumstances, normal human beings are going to come out of that whole thing just as perfectly as they went into it. Uh, sometimes uh, strenuous situations put strains on social relationships. People who may be living in fear of their status, their possessions, and how they even see themselves, uh, sometimes will begin to act in ways which are not so nice. Uh, we begin to see, uh, you know, the increased shootings in the public of black men and women. We begin to see increasing amount of hatred shown toward Asian Americans. And some people might wonder, wh where is all this coming from and where does it stop? Well, many of us know where it comes from. Uh, the kind of racism, bigotry that's unfortunately has permeated uh, the American experience for the last 300 years. Um, but to to give comfort and aid to our brothers and sisters who are Asian, Asian Americans, uh, and uh, from the Pacific Isles, um, we are going to devote some space right now. At Seton Hall University, um, I remember when an organization of, uh, uh, of uh, students who happened to be a Filipino background, I remember when that organization got started, the Filipino League at Seton Hall, better known as the acronym of FLASH. We've asked for a representative of that organization to come forward today and to share with us uh, their concerns and what they would like us to know about the AAPI experience as it relates uh, to the very recent events against them. So I'm gonna have their representative, Danielle, uh, to, uh, tell you who she is, what she does at Seton Hall, and then we will segue to her prepared uh, presentation, which represents uh, the feelings, the thoughts, um, and the viewpoints of her organization, Flash. Thank you, Danielle. Hi. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Um, yeah. So, as you said, my name is Danielle Vo. Um, I am currently a junior here at Dean Hall studying biology. Um, this past year, I was the events coordinator for Flash. Although I'm not Filipino, I'm actually Vietnamese. Um, there are common just identifiers within the Asian American community that just allows me to relate with this club. And yeah, so I'm really happy to be here to share about all the experiences that many people are facing currently. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share my, um, a little presentation that we did. Um, it was a round table discussion in collabor uh, non collaboration, but uh, it went, coincided with a visual we hosted just this past month. I believe I could just do this and then, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So as I said before, um, my name's Danielle. Unfortunately, my other uh, collaborators and presenters are unable to make it today. But if you would like to just reach out to them or gain more insight on anything we or I will be discussing about, um, their names are Neil Bayon, Brittany Chin, Rick Mabalatan, and Katrina Toledo. But I just wanted to get started by having a wellness check. Um, Essentially, everything that we'll be talking about um, may hit close to home, whether you're Asian American or a minority. Um, mm -hmm. Everything that has been happening, the insensible violence that has been occurring um, in the media against Asian Americans is very disheartening. For me, especially, um, I went through cycles of emotions, feeling pain, anger, confusion about why this has been occurring. but. I want to let everyone know that it's okay to be having these emotions. They are completely valid. And um, at a certain point, these emotions will kind of transform into action. And it just all begins a discussion. Oh, and again, um, I do encourage everyone to use the chat function. Um, this was the roundtable discussion. And it was really 
Um, amazing to see everyone just discussing their um, beliefs. I don't know if I'll get any notifications because I am sharing my screen, but I will look back at it and answer any questions that anyone does have. But I want to start out with this prompt and it just says, where do you believe anti-Asian violence has been from and what are the causes? And a major root of these problems do go back all the way from history, probably around the 1850s um, when Chinese immigrants did start to come over to America. And this is, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is called People versus Call. So essentially this was a legislation that deemed Chinese Americans as incapable of intelligent progression. So their word in law was just not acceptable. And of course that is completely wrong. And, but we see this discrimination all the way back from the 1850s. And then as we progress um, later on, um, around the 1900s, the Chinese Exclusion Act kind of went, um, coincided with the yellow peril that kind of encompasses all the hatred and violence that has been occurring in the past. So yellow peril essentially is, um, well, throughout history, demonized Asian Americans, um, portrayed them as lesser, as evil, as promiscuous, and made people view them as lesser. And this kind of goes hand in hand with other instances of violence. So a, a prominent, uh, I would say, occurrence that happened around the 1900s was the San Francisco plague, which we see is very similar to what's happening now with the coronavirus. Um, essentially, this was with the bubonic plague. And one of the first people to pass away from the bubonic plague during this time was a Chinese immigrant. And for that reason, everyone blamed them for bringing over the virus and causing this like chaos and death tolls. And this is very comparable to what we're seeing now with the coronavirus and why um, we kind of see our, the, the spikes of Asian hate crimes and Asian violence. So another aspect of this are the perceptions that are viewed of Asian Americans. Um, these are little prompts. So essentially what perceptions are pushed onto Asian Americans, um, how it may lead to violence, and even if these perceptions are positive, and also if there are any contributions from myself or Asian Americans themselves or other people that just allow these perceptions to constantly be there in <laughs> everyone's mindset. So I wanted to first start out with Asian fetishization. Um, this can kind of go from just fetishization with cultural appropriation all the way up to um, sexual violence. So with the current event of uh, the Lampa Spa shooting, that is one of the major things we see. Uh, Asian women particularly um, in history before were viewed as um, very promiscuous, very docile individuals and the need to just break that mindset is so necessary as we can see by the insensible violence caused by these three spa um, massage parlors um, that these women were just working and making a living for themselves but were attacked just because of like their skin color and what they were doing to make a living. Um, Additionally, with um, more so on like the lesser side, things like makeup, um, trends and everything of that sorts, the smaller things. Um, people, I don't know if anyone's aware of, but there's this thing called the fox eye trend with makeup that uh, many, um, I guess, white Americans or white counterparts, they would make their eye shapes seem similar to Asians and kind of pull their eyes back in many photos and many media outlets like Vogue and all these high end fashion brands and everything are just pulling their eyes back for like campaigns for, um, I guess their makeup lines or anything of that sort, which is kind of insane to think about because when we see people pulling their eyes back, it's very much triggering for many other people yet at the same time, they don't see the extent of how that can um, perpetuate 
these or perpetuate the idea that it's okay to kind of be racist towards Asian. Um, it doesn't need to be such derogatory terms such as yellow or chink to um, garner these ideas that it's okay to kind of like bully Asian Americans. It can be little things like that, like pulling your eyes back for a makeup trend um, without realizing the extent of their actions. Um, again, with perpetual service workers, um, Asian Americans are seen as weak and kind of able to, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, seen as weak and just um, very much service um, oriented, uh, putting their heads down, being, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The, the word, for, I was very much trying to find this word, but anyways, um, they were in history seen in the service aspect when, especially with immigrants. And for that reason, there's just this constant idea that they're lesser or should be treated as service workers, which doesn't necessarily make any sense. Uh, again, uh, the Atlanta shootings really kind of made this more apparent and again, needs to stop. And I just want to lastly point out with the model minority myth, um, again, this is, seems like a positive thing to have, like Asian Americans are super hard workers, they're smart, intelligent, the stereotype that they go into STEM and are very much science-based, but this is very detrimental not only to the Asian Americans' mental health, but it pins other minorities against each other and makes them focus on a problem that isn't the root of the racism and um, prejudice that have been occurring. The overall oppressive nature of the system um, really wants to highlight this just to, I guess, pin everyone against each other, which again, um, it's the model minority myth. It also dismisses everything mm -hmm. or the struggles that many low-income Asian Americans are facing. Um, we see crazy rich Asians like the movie um, Bling Nation, uh, these like ideas that Asians are super like rich and kind of super smart, but in reality, it just is not necessarily the case and needs to be dismantled because it, again, <laughs> um, is very problematic with mental health and just everything that's occurring in our nation. And on the note of mental health, um, I guess a major thing is that the collectivist versus individualistic aspect of our um, cultures. So Asian culture is very collectivist, is a very collectivist um, culture. So that just means that we are more socially with like community aspects, um, care more about, I guess that familial, um, many minorities have this kind of collectivist nature. Um, while in America, there is more of an individual, individualistic um, idealization, which is like more so the need for autonomy and individualism in all of those respects. So when Asian Americans come here from their homeland, they kind of still have those, uh, well, uh, sorry, they still have those um, ideals. And it doesn't really coincide well with the individualism that is very prominent here. Um, it kind of has an effect on how we kind of take action on the violence that has been occurring or from any prejudice that we face. We choose to um, put our heads down, which I don't necessarily think we have like a head down mentality, but we choose to be complacent so that we don't bother other people. Um, that's a general feeling that many people face. Um, we just don't want to cause problems with our family, put them in harm, um, make our community seem um, not proud or just any of those sorts. So we choose to throw away any or like hard feelings that we face from racist, um, any other feelings of um, emotional discomfort and choose to just push it aside, but that needs to end, especially 
with mental health and everything becoming more prominent in our, the Asian community, there has been a huge stigma, um, even more than it usually is in general with mental health. Um, the stigma is really that it's not okay. It's like not even a real thing in many Asian Americans. Um, they choose to just power through it. But again, that just leads us to kind of accepting all of the hate that has been occurring, which is a huge problem. So again, what I uh, mentioned before with the collectivist culture and our respective homelands and how we respond mm -hmm. to it, um, it's just why we see these rise of cases now more than ever is because we're tired of being complacent with all the actions that have been occurring. It's been occurring for like since the 1850s, um, hatred, violence, particularly violence have been occurring and no one seems to want to document it and that's a huge problem that was um in the past but now that uh, we have the resources and the feeling that we, we do deserve to be here um it's so important that we kind of take a stand so with the current events um how has COVID-19 revealed or unveiled the violence that has been happening in our community? Um, more so that, again, uh, American society or government, um, I would say that whenever a problem arises, they very much um, use scapegoats to deal with their problems. It happens in many other instances of chaos and just uncertainties. So I would say that previous administration, when they say that this is the Kung Flu virus, it just garners that um, idea that if the higher administrator is able to be racist towards um, a whole Asian community and it's okay for him to do that, then everyone else is allowed to do that as well, which is completely wrong. And that's why we're seeing this rise of cases. Um, it's also has been there, again, everyone, um, the sorry, <laughs> the thing that I've mentioned before has just accumulated into what's happening now, but it's just not okay. And we need to understand that scapegoating is really not okay, whether it's with the Asian American community or just any minority and vulnerable individual. And I want to just outline a couple of more current issues. I did mention the Lanza shooting, but then we see just um, the Filipino woman, she was a 65 year old woman in New York City on her way to church and um, she was just insensibly beaten up and in front of, I believe it was a, it was a, either a hotel or a um, apartment building and the security guard just shut the door on her. And I think that was just insane to see someone enduring so much violence and hurt and the fact that it was a little Asian old woman who the security guards are supposed to protect, essentially protect their um, building, which the violence happened right outside, um, doesn't make any sense to me. So I just want to also um, mention that in these instances, there are so many things we can do to kind of combat the violence and racism without actually putting ourselves in harm. Um, like to say it's the five D's, which is distract, delegate, delay, direct, and document. Um, of course, distract, you can just shout randomly saying there's a fire, you're seeing all this violence happening, garner more attention for people to come over so it stops the perpetrator from causing any more harm. Um, delegate, you can just simply tell people what's happening, like, hey, this person's being um, abused, being anything of that sort, and just gain more attention towards the problem. With delay, um, this is kind of misleading, but afterwards you can just delay the individual from ever coming back um, who caused the issue and be on the side with the victim, stay with them, make sure they're being comforted, see their, see if they're emotionally well, um, get them help and everything of that sort. And then also direct again, just if you feel that the environment is safe, um, you can just put yourself between the victim and the perpetrator and say to them what they're doing is wrong and hopefully stop the incident from ever occurring. 
And again, document. Documenting is a huge um, thing nowadays. It allows people to just see what is actually occurring in these issues. So there's so many ways we can kind of help out, but if one thing is just document and try to um, gain attention to the problems that have occurred, um, occurred in the past recent years and throughout history is just, for, yeah, documentation. And I also wanted to say um, that there are many kind of uh, resources to use in our community, which is TAPS when you're feeling any, um, again, feeling unsure about everything and want to talk to them. They're a great way to just um, let everything go, talk to them, just feel safe in your emotions and whatnot. And also this was in collaboration was with diversity, equity, and inclusion group, um, the roundtable discussion and such, and also Office of Student Engagement, um, Monica Burnett, and as well as um, Colleen Dalaval. Uh, they help collaborate with the visual and roundtable discussion. So they would be more than happy to also be a resource to just talk to. And then with any other, um, if you wanted to do some more research, these are other um, organizations that are a great way to just learn, get insight, maybe donate to help out, which is the Asian American Advancing Just Justice and StopAPI8.org. And lastly, these are more resources, um, Asian Americans Advancing Resources, Hate is a Virus, um, Asian Mental Health Collective. These are just great ways to just learn about everything that has been going on. And yeah, I'm pretty much done with my presentation. Thank you again for everyone that's listening. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, I guess, do research and really see that uh, a lot of people are suffering. And if you're not aware of anything that has been going on or just don't know that you, um, are able to help, um, there's always ways to help. I think just educating yourselves and kind of starting that discussion really is the first step to everything. And I just want to thank Dr. Pritchett again for allowing me to um, talk about it. Um, but everyone who were with my collaborators I mentioned before are great um, people to just talk to if you want to just talk more about it on the side. I was going fast, it, this was, a two-hour discussion before so I was all over the place and I know my other collaborators had a lot more to say but thank you again thank you Danielle uh, but to support you you did a fine job but it's actually more important that it something be said that we fill the space and we fill all of us uh, with the understanding uh, of the sensitivity you are our brothers and sisters and many of us who have been fighting this battle for hundreds of years uh, <laughs> stand next to you as allies to prop you up, you and your families, during these moments of stress. But we, we thank you for making yourself available. Uh, we know that as we come down the home stretch to the semester, uh, time is tight for all of us, but we, uh, we thank you for being present. We are now going to segue uh, to faculty presentations in the spirit of global justice um, and honoring the traditions of Nelson Mandela and Dr. Martin Luther King. But in the context, we've um, asked, um, uh, put a call out to faculty uh, to join us today and uh, just to share uh, from their frameworks of disciplines, the schools they're involved with, uh, their academic scholarship and or their civic engagement. You know, what kind of things are they wrapping their heads and their time and their interest around? So I'm pleased to present um, to you two of our faculty members. We're going to have them introduce themselves, but in the context, let's uh, personalize this. Um, how long have you been in the teaching career? How long at Seton Hall? What are your fields, your backgrounds? Just so that you become more than a, uh, a screenshot for someone. But um, at this moment, we'll now turn to our faculty portion of the morning. And we've got uh, Ben and Sol Jamdo. And um, so they're now going to let you know who they are and whichever uh, one of you will be going first, just um, take the, uh, the their helms. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Reverend. 
Pritchett, I think you had asked me to go first. So um, I think that's, if it's okay with Professor uh, Goldfrank, then I will go ahead. Sure, okay with there, you? there is a little bit of static. I don't know, uh, Bert is gonna. Really, I'm sorry. No, no, uh, it's just yeah, that's why I'm A little bit on your uh, microphone feed. You may want to just try and unmute, remute. Um, that kind of thing might fix it. Is that better? It, it's it's just kind of coming through. It, it it's just it's signal strength. It's nothing you're doing wrong. It's you know it's bandwidth. So uh, I'm we kind of that's okay. We can move <laughs> forward. Not your fault at all. Okay, we checked everything a little while ago, and we were working. Everything was fine. So when we did the tech check a little while ago, still having problems. You're still it's talking. just just a little, but uh, there's nothing we can do about it. We might as well just roll forward. Hmm. Okay, we, we, I'm not... we hear your voice perfectly. It's just that you've got all of this static with it, but we hear you fine. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, if there's anything you can figure out, I mean, please tell me what to do. Right. So my name my name is Sol Angel Maldonado, and I teach at the law school. I've been at the law school for 20, 21 years. And um, I teach courses in family law, torts, per, which is personal injury law, uh, and also wills, trusts, and estates. And I wanted to start, well, what I really wanted to focus on is really how, how faculty at, at Seton Hall and, and, um, can address or uh, have been addressing racial and other forms of inequality. And I wanted to focus specifically on the changes that some of my colleagues and I have made in our courses to facilitate discussions about race, gender, and class inequality, among others, in large doctrinal courses, you know, courses where you know, students, they may be required, so that we can allow students of diverse backgrounds to feel that their experiences and perspectives are, are valued. So I should start by pointing out that Seton Hall Law School has been engaged in formal efforts to further diversity and belonging in the law school and in the legal profession since at least 2008, when the then Dean of the Law School, Patrick Hobbs, created the Dean's Diversity Council, which was an advisory body of alumni, faculty, administrators, and student leaders that worked together to promote a diverse and inclusive academic environment. Dean Hobbs then appointed me as the, uh, as the chair of the Diversity Council, and he also hired a diversity officer to spearhead our, our initiatives, which by the, at the time in 2008 made Seton Hall Law one of the first law schools in the nation with such a position. And so we worked together with the admissions office, with the Office of Student Life, and with Career Services to coordinate all of our initiatives. And one of the things that I think I wanted, uh, wanted to highlight is we hosted what was then the largest conference of, of professors of color, bringing together 500 law professors, over 500 law professors, over a four-day period with keynote speakers like Reverend Jesse Jackson um, Sr., who, I mean, I, I think all of you know, was the African-American civil rights leader who had sought the Demo uh, Democratic presidential nomination more than two decades before um, Barack Obama became president. Um, we also included students of color uh, in these conversations and in, in about issues of particular salience, salience to our communities. And I published an article describing the conference and the importance of these diversity initiatives um, in law schools. But fast forward to, two, to 2015, although Seton Hall Law continued to engage in these efforts to foster an inclusive environment and a sense of belonging for every student, some of our students of color um, and LGBTQ students we're continuing to have negative experiences in the classroom. And the reason is that the cases and the materials that we read in class, uh, for class, and the discussions of these materials just did not reflect these experiences. So to be specific, the materials that we read um, and that we still read in most uh, doctrinal uh, courses in law school suggest that the law is objective, it does not discriminate, um, and that the standards that we learn, such as the reasonable person standard, that these are objective and that they are universal. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, the law is very much subjective, and decisions are influenced by race, gender, class, sexual orientation, religion, gender identity, um, you know, of, of the lawmakers, of the decision makers, and of the 
parties of a particular case. Now, none of this is new. This is the basis of critical legal studies, critical race studies, um, Latinx uh, critical race theory, class crit, but students weren't being exposed to these perspectives in any doctrinal courses. So it became very clear to me and some of my colleagues that although we could continue to recruit students of color and to have many events to celebrate diversity and also require implicit bias training and cultural competency training for students and faculty, that if the material learned in the classroom excludes the perspectives of racial and ethnic minorities and of sexual minorities and religious minorities and individuals from economically vulnerable communities, then students are going to experience the law school as very much an alienating um, space. I just want to stop for a moment. Has it gotten better or are you still struggling to hear me? <laughs> it, 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 we can hear you. It's just a little staticky. The honest answer is you'd probably need a, a full restart. Um, as long as all your cables are connected, there's really nothing we can do to troubleshoot it right now. So okay. we're just going to have to roll with the punches, but we can, we're okay. getting all the awesome content for what it's worth. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So, um, okay, so, so as I was saying, you know, we can do all of these diversity initiatives, but if we don't actually change what we are teaching in the classroom, then students are going to continue to experience, you know, the class, the classroom where they're spending 15 to 18 hours a week, they're going to experience it as a very alienating um, space. So I teach torts, which is a required course that students at Seton Hall, Seton Hall um, and at most law schools take in their first semester. And I decided that the best way to include the perspectives of individuals of different backgrounds um, and perspectives that challenge the dogma that law is objective um, and that the law is just was to find a casebook that did that work for me. So I had attended a number of conferences for faculty of color um, and colleagues at other uh, other law schools had recommended a specific torts book because it approached the subject of torts, personal injury law, from a racial, gender, and social uh, justice uh, perspective. Um, so I spoke to another colleague at Seton Hall, a very senior colleague who also teaches torts, and the two of us decided to adopt um, this casebook. The experience has been transformative. And the reason is that the book includes, you know, doctrinal cases that illustrate how the tort system's mechanism for determining the value of an injury, you know, how much is, is a pain and suffering worth, for example, or the value of human life when someone negligently ends up killing someone else, um, that the tort, the tort system itself reinforces racial, gender, and class inequalities in our society. The casebook also includes modern cases in which students can see the assumptions that judges make about individuals based on race, based on gender, sexual orientation, class, and religion. And it also challenges you know, these, uh, these standards that the law has told us are race and gender neutral, such as the reasonable person standard. But it shows how these standards really reflect a white um, uh, heterosexual male gaze. And so these materials allow me to prepare my students to have these uncomfortable conversations about you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, and class, even before they come to the classroom on their first day. So one of the things that I, that I started to do is that I include language in the syllabus that specifically tells students, um, and I'm just going to read this language, I tell them, as we learn the law of tort, we will examine um, a couple of things here, and then I, I say we will examine how racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination affect how losses are allocated. And then in the course objectives that are stated in the syllabus, I also you know, have language that says that after completion of this course, you should be able to confidently recognize how the rules, standards, and principles of tort law create, reinforce, or ameliorate inequalities within our society. So students are already expecting that they, they need to you know, be prepared to have these conversations. Um, and so students um, of different backgrounds, students of color, women, and LGBTQ students have repeatedly told me that although these conversations are, are difficult, they feel that they have a space where they can see multiple perspectives represented and where they can share their own um, experiences. So after doing torts, I, want, I wanted my upper level students to have the same opportunities um, in my upper level courses. And so I teach family law, which is an elective, um, but that it's on the bar exam, so many students take it. Just to give you an example, just this last semester, I had 103 students enrolled in, in two sections. 
Now, family law casebooks have been pretty good about addressing gender inequality. Um, in the last decade, they've done a decent job of addressing how the law discriminates against LGBTQ individuals. However, these casebooks have basically failed to address how racial inequality um, and, and, and family law have created and perpetuated racial subordination. So what I was doing for many years is I was supplementing with my own materials, you know, to provide students from different backgrounds from or with a similar classroom experience as the students in my torts course who had this phenomenal social justice casebook. Um, but supplementing, you know, well, not only was it a lot of work uploading everything to Blackboard, but it also I had to worry about am I violating some fair use rules, copyright laws, all of that. So in 2018, actually uh, beginning of 2019, what I did is I joined the editors of that casebook and we just revamped it completely. And we revamped it to make race and social inequality the central theme of the book. So virtually every chapter of this 1500 page book includes cases and articles that illustrate how the law today continues to subordinate um, racial minorities. So I'm just gonna give you, I guess I'll, um, I haven't been keeping track of my time. Do I have like two minutes? Do I have two no, you're minutes fine. left? You're okay. fine. Right. You take your time. Take your time. Okay. okay. So just to give you an example of, you know, how um, these materials, these doctrinal rules, you know, uh, uh, if by including certain cases, I'm able to address race and, and social inequality. When we covered the rules for entry into marriage, um, the book assigns materials showing that African Americans were denied the right to marry during slavery. And so we look at how the state sanction, and then we also look at how state sanctioned racial segregation has led to economic inequality that continues today and which negatively impacts the rate of marriage in the African American community. So we get to have this rich conversation about how is it that African Americans are the group that reveres marriage the most. But, in, but are also the group that is least likely to marry as a result of policies that perpetuate racial inequality. When we cover Loving versus Virginia, which is the 1967 Supreme Court case that holds that laws prohibiting interracial marriage are unconstitutional, um, you know, students usually think, well, that's 1967. That's completely irrelevant. Um, what, what we do is that we also discuss a 2019 case in which the state of Virginia continue to require individuals applying for a marriage license to check their race on a form. This is a government form that you have to fill out when you're applying for a marriage license. And the classifications, the racial classifications in the form, this is 2019, include categories as quadroon, mulatto, octoroon. I mean, it, it, identifications, classifications that I think many of us thought were just, you know, had been, had been abolished. Um, when we, when we examine um, laws requiring individuals to apply for a marriage license in person, we read a case in which a person who wanted to marry someone who was actually incarcerated could not obtain the marriage license and successfully argued that the in-person requirement placed an unconstitutional restriction on the right to marry. And the court focuses on the effect of mass incarceration and specifically on the very high rates of incarceration in the state of Kentucky um, and how and what the impact that, that mass incarceration has on communities of color. So it allows for students of color and students you know, who have family members or friends who have been swept up in the criminal justice system to share their, their perspectives. Um, just to give you a couple more examples, when we covered child custody, I included a case in which the court accepts expert testimony that reflects deeply problematic stereotypes about African American women. Um, I also included a case that shows how the law treats transgender parents and transgender children. And so these materials lead to a robust discussion about um, in which students of all backgrounds, you know, are assigned to represent different perspectives and where you know, all views um, can be heard. Um, when we cover corporal punishment, I assign materials that address the racial and cultural differences in the practice and whether the law should recognize um, these differences. Uh, when we look at the foster care system, I assign the case in, that looks at, um, which really almost pits the rights of LGBTQ individuals to apply to become foster parents, um, but those rights conflict with the religious convictions 
of institutions, in this case, Catholic social services, that contract with the state to provide uh, foster parent um, you know, certification um, services. And then yesterday, which was my last class, I had, you know, which I think was going to go down and sort of in my 20 years of experience as the best class I had, we discussed a case in which um, a white couple who wanted to have a child using assisted reproductive technologies sued the fertility clinic because the clinic accidentally, erroneously, artificially inseminated the woman with the sperm of an African-American donor, even though the couple had specifically really uh, selected a white donor. It was a white couple, they selected a white donor. In the lawsuit, the white couple acknowledged that they had a beautiful and healthy child, but they alleged that they had suffered damages because the child was black, she was biracial, and that now the white couple who had always lived in a white neighborhood had to go to a, an African-American neighborhood so they could find a salon specializing in black hair. And they also allege as their damages that as a multiracial family, they were now experiencing the same type of racial discrimination that African-Americans have long faced. So you can just imagine the richness of the conversation on the last day of class. Um, and I just wanted to just, you know, point out that the height you know, of this conversation was a, a question that was posed by an African-American um, student who said, imagine that the couple in this case had been African-American and that the fertility clinic had accidentally artificially inseminated the woman with the sperm of a white donor, even though the, they had specifically selected an African-American donor. What damages would that couple be able to assert? So that question just shows how bringing these materials um, together in a, in a doctrinal course like family law just enriches the conversation and recognizes the experiences and perspectives of all of our students. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you have stimulated my imagination <laughs> with that last case study. But um, and I think um, I, I, I put a comment there about the nature of the book, how relevant that really was. I, I was uh, so kudos to you and your colleagues. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Ben, are you ready? Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, Dr. Pritchett and, and, and Professor Maldonado. Um, I've been teaching at Seton Hall since 2007, so I guess this is 14 years I'm about to complete. Um, and I teach mostly in Latin American politics and some of the um, uh, senior thesis uh, classes as well. Um, that's what I'm, I'm teaching this semester, one, one, one section of each. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have some slides here. And what I'm going to talk about today is not um, not the School of Diplomacy's uh, diversity, equity, inclusion and justice initiative, but a, um, a study that a colleague and, and I are doing about uh, the, the presence of women in Latin American political science departments and academic journals. Um, so this is a, a study that we've started a few months ago uh, with Yanina Welp, who's a professor at the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy in, in Geneva. Um, and so um, I thought that this could be a an interesting um, an interesting topic for for this for this conversation today. I hope uh, I hope it, it fits in OK. Um, so I'm just going to give some uh, uh, sort of the preliminary findings of the study, but I want to sort of lay out the, the context a little bit first. So Latin America is the world region with the highest average percentage of women in national legislatures. And women there now make up a disproportionately large per percentage of university students. They've also made gains in labor force participation. Um, but at the same time, in political science, uh, according to, to some studies uh, of a, a small subset of Latin American countries, it seems that women remain underrepresented in the discipline of political science as graduate students, faculty members, and as solo authors of articles in top journals, among other indicators. 
So our research examines the question of women's presence in Latin American political science in both broader and narrower senses, right? So on one hand, we expand the number of Latin American countries examined from the six where political science is most institu institutionalized as a discipline. So we, we go from those six to include all cases, all countries where we can find both political science departments and academic journals. So we've got a we've got um, 16, 16 or 17 countries uh, included here. Um, we also expand the number of journals assessed from nine to 64 journals publishing political science research in Latin America and 16 Latin Americanist journals uh, published in Canada, the US and Europe. Right, so, so we're expanding in one sense, but in, in another sense, our focus is on political science departments and academic journals only, rather than also including graduate students, academic associations, and other indicators that some of these uh, smaller studies have looked at. Um, so specifically what we're doing uh, is is following um, research by Stegmeier et al. and Palmer et al. on on academic journals in the United States, um, and what we're doing is comparing the proportion of female political science faculty members to the proportion of women serving as editors and as members of editorial committees and international advisory committees for these eighty uh, academic journals. In addition to this, uh, in, in addition to, to assessing this comparison across Latin American countries, we plan to compare Latin America based journals with those based outside the region, as well as evaluating our findings in light of these similar studies in the United States. All right, so the, the broader survey we employ aims to assess women's presence in the field of political science in the region as a whole. Um, but the, the, the narrower uh, focus on faculty members and journals is going to help us facilitate cross-national and cross-regional comparison, given that there's a lot of data deficiencies uh, in, in, in some of the countries that we're looking at. So, our special attention to journal editorial and advisory committees also serves a practical purpose and, and that is if our assumption that latin american based political science journals uh, political science journal committees are disproportionately male if, if that assumption is correct achieving gender parity on such committees is a relatively easy and potentially powerful reform. Gender parity in academic journals could be accomplished much more quickly than reaching gender parity in faculty ranks, um, and it could signal the removal of at least some of the barriers to women's advancement in the discipline, and thus encourage more women to apply for political science doctoral programs and faculty positions. So those advances in gender parity in turn could also uh, potentially help um, promote pluralism in the in the sort of the theoretical approaches in the discipline as well as um, uh, sort of pluralism in the topics considered. Right. So our main goal is to map the gender balance in the political science discipline across the region, but we're also going to try to test a few hypotheses based on the scant existing literature about this topic. Right. So, uh, so the first of these is that countries where political science has been institutionalized as a discipline uh, for 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 longer. Um, these these six here, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Uruguay, we are we we assume that these should have more uh, female faculty members in political science departments and more proportional representation as editors of journals and as members of editorial and advisory boards. 
Second, uh, a second hypothesis is that Latin American political science departments will have a smaller share of women and a smaller percentage of senior female faculty members than political science departments in the, in the United States following that, that notion of uh, longer institutionalization of, of political science as a discipline. Um, we also uh, think that what we're going to find is that women in Latin American political science departments and journals um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a proportion of the total numbers of faculty members and, and, and journal editors, et cetera, um, will be fewer or will be greater than uh, the percentage. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I, um, I, I, I put the I put the arrow in the wrong direction here. It should be f less than the, the the percentage of women um, in, in in Latin American um, legislatures in Congress, right? Um, and then finally, um, Latin American based political science journals we 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 hypothesize will will have um, fewer women as editors and fewer women as a so a smaller proportion of women in on editorial and advisory boards compared to Latin Americanist journals based outside of, of Latin America. Um, so let, let me show you what we've what we've found so far. Um, right now we're in the, the data gathering phase still um, and we have uh, we've we've looked at 80 journals in 25 countries most of them, as I said, in, in Latin American countries. And these are all journals that either are uh, only only set, uh, published political science research or social social science research with a heavy proportion of, of political science articles or Latin American studies journals that include uh, many political science articles. And those those are typically the ones in non-Latin American countries. Um, we're also gathering data currently on the 220 departments with political science degrees that we found um, that, uh, that offer at least bachelor's or master's degrees. And we're, we're, we've, we have 220 departments identified uh, and we're trying to find the um, the gender composition in these in these departments, but it's very difficult to do this because many Latin American universities are not digitized yet, and they do not, or they do not have websites with complete information about their about their faculty members, um, and so that's been that's been a challenge. But we're we're in the process of of uh, of gathering that data, not only through websites but also through through contacts. Um, and trying to get um, get uh, individual department members to to provide that data for us. Um, all right. So what we found so far is that for all eighty journals, um, the editors, the, the the leading editors or co-editors. Some journals have have uh, an editor or, or or more than one editor. Forty three percent. Are, are women, which seems like a a pretty uh, a, a pretty high number, especially in comparison to U.S. political science journals, where the number is a little bit less. Um, but when you break it out into Latin American journals versus uh, journals focused on Latin America but based outside of the region, the numbers are quite different, right? You can see there's a much higher proportion. In fact. There are more women uh, serving as editors in journals outside of Latin America. Um, more more women than men. Um, if you look at the editorial board members, 32% are women in the 71 journals that list uh, editorial board members. And again, there's a pretty dramatic difference between the Latin American uh, the journals based in Latin America and the journals uh, focused on Latin America, but not based there. And then finally, we looked at the advisory uh, or international advisory boards uh, for, for these journals. 
And here, the percentage of women is much lower. Uh, it's less than 30%, less than, than one in three. Um, and the difference between the Latin American journals and the Latin American IST journals in other in other countries is not as is not as great. Um, and still there's a there's a pretty big, pretty big gap, right? So up till now, the 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 gender gap that we have uh, that we expected um, has been confirmed at least in terms of the journals. But what we what we really want to do is compare the percentage of, of of women on the journal mastheads essentially um, with the percentage of of women in um, in academic departments and political science departments because it's unlikely that you're going to have more women on uh, on journal mastheads um, than than in political science departments and that's the that's the um, the sort of the the proportion that these um, these other articles that we've been basing our research on are using, right? But what we found so far again is that one in three political science journals, journal editors and editorial and advisory board members are women in Latin America. So there is a, 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 a gender gap here. Um, the journals based outside of the region have more gender balance, especially with regard to editors. Um, and to some degree for editorial board members as well, but not for some reason for international advisory boards. Um, we also find that in comparison to the United States, there seem to be smaller advances for women in Latin American political science compared to compared to the US, and that's in line with uh, with our original hypothesis. And finally, what this seems to be pointing to is that women appear to have advanced more towards gender parity in Latin American politics, especially with, with regard to uh, representation in Congress than they have in political science on the one hand. And on the other hand, in the United States, women have advanced more towards parity in political science than they have in, in politics. Right? There's, the US remains, um, uh, a country with with uh, quite a small percentage of of women in the House of Representatives, uh, for example, um, and I can just show you that really quickly. The articles that we're that we're comparing to are from Palmer et al. You can see that the percentage of women as uh, editors and, and associate editors and board members on journals is now roughly 35%, whereas the percentage of women in the House of Representatives is 27%, right? So there's still uh, a greater advance in political science than there is in, in politics. So I think I'm just going to leave it there and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this, about this study. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Are there any questions from anyone? I placed a, a couple of concepts in the uh, chat only to uh, let people know that there are numerous ways in which I guess if people are using a um, the uh, a diversity perspective and as a paradigm of looking at issues and um, and indeed uh, this idea of when we are in one profession, <clears throat> and um, I think the it's it's also fascinating when we get out of the realm of our, what we call local, which may be North America, and then you're looking at the dis, uh, the distribution of women as you started. Very fascinating kind of a topic. Reminds me of um, when I was an undergraduate decades ago. I was I was looking at the issue of sorry, there's an echo. But, and and static, interesting. But um, I was interested in what we then called, and excuse the terminology, but this was for that period. We called it manpower studies, which has in essence really meant uh, the people are in different fields. But I was looking at um, how who got in the med school in America, what the distribution of 
or in the medical profession, but I was this was to be late sixties. And we found it to be, I, w- I would say, we could say disproportionately male, but on the other hand, it wasn't. It was socially appropriate that the majority of physicians would have been over 80% white males and then a, a smaller percentage of women and then uh, very few people of color. Uh, when I look at, on the other hand, how um, the medical profession was looked at in a controlled society like in Russia, I believe over 80% of the uh, doc fee- physicians were female because at a certain point uh, that we might consider junior high school, they begin, based upon your standardized scores and testing, uh, they begin to uh, put people onto career tracks that matched up with their testing. So we found that women in the Soviet Union, for example, on at least on paper and, and tests, were uh, leap years ahead of their male counterparts. But I, I only share that in the context of time and distance. Uh, are there any questions at all from anyone in the audience? Looks like Professor yeah, yeah. Maldonado has a yeah. question. You Definitely. can open up your microphone, Professor. Go right ahead. Let's try this. Hi, sorry about that. So um, my question is, what um, what difference do you think that having gender parity um, on on editorial boards will make on the types of articles um, that that are selected? I mean, do you think it will you know sort of have a, a practical effect on the work that's out there? Yeah, that's um, that's what's been argued for in these smaller the smaller subset of studies that um, actually looked at. Um, the um, not only the editorial mastheads, but all uh, journal mastheads, but also who um, who publishes articles. So um, something like thirty percent of the articles were public that were had single authors were published by women, and seventy percent were published by men in this in this um, in this study of nine journals the sort of nine top journals in, in Latin American political science. Um, so one thing is that there, there's a, uh, an assumption that with more or an argument that m- with more women on the editorial board, you might have more women submitting articles uh, for publication, but also that the um, the types of approaches, um, theoretical approaches um, that that uh, female political science use might be uh, uh, it might in- encourage a, a sort of a pluralization of the field, and also that the the topics, the content would uh, would 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 change and 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 um, include include uh, different areas that have been overlooked in political science. Yeah. So it's both it's it's both potentially interesting for the field and political science journals, but also for sort of encouraging women to to join political science in in larger numbers and and achieve parity. And part of this came about because um, Yanina and I both received a request to um, to do a review, an article review for a manuscript review for a, for a journal based in Chile, and um, she had just she's part of the this red de politologas, the network of female political scientists that she co-founded, and they have a bunch of um, sort of recommendations for how to achieve uh, gender parity in political science, and. One, she had just tweeted about how she had about that you shouldn't um, do article reviews for journals that don't have gender parity in the in the on the editorial board. And so I saw that, and I looked at the the editorial board of the journal that uh, that had sent me the review, and they it was it was it was embarrassingly lopsided. I mean, it was like. 25 men to three women on the International Advisory Board. And so um, I emailed back and forth with her and we talked about this and we both rejected this journal uh, review uh, request, uh, article review request. And then we started talking about 
doing this project. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Yep. I think Anna had a question or comment. I do. Um, Professor Goldfrank, in the 38 percent um, that you cited as part of your research, did you find that one country was perhaps ahead of any other country within South America or was it pretty evenly spaced out? So I haven't looked at the journals by country yet, um, but in other research about Brazil, Brazilian political science departments seem to be um, uh, seem to be closer to gender parity. Um, in fact, the 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 president of the Brazilian Political Science Association right now is a woman, Flavia Biroli, um, and and some of the leading journals in 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 Brazil are um, edited by women right now. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, sure. And let's see, I see another hand up, if I can identify that person, Lisa. It's your friendly librarian here. Hello, Reverend Pritchard. Hi so there. Dr. Goldfriend, you have just given me a wonderful idea for what I hope would be a quick paper, but my ideas for quick papers always turn out to be mammoth jobs. Um, this not just publications, but I never really thought of linking it to the editorial board, is a huge problem in STEM, particularly in chemistry. I am not aware that any research on the composition of editorial boards has been done in that field or any STEM fields, but I'm, I'm putting it on my increasingly long to-do list, so thank you for that um, great, great suggestion. Thanks very much. Well, thank no you problem. for tuning in. <laughs> if you if you send me an email, I will send you uh, my my read my bibliography, which includes some um, some articles about editorial boards for different in different fields. Is it, I didn't even know this was a field of research. So. <laughs> no, um, it, it ties in actually very much with, I've already published a paper on citation patterns in chemistry journals, um, you know, the leading chemistry journals, and I'm actually working on one with graduate students. And it, it would be difficult to sort out gender, but I might be able to. But this sounds like, I'm tempted to say an easy way, but boy, I've said that with papers before that, oh, I could bang this one out mm -hmm. quickly and a, a year later still working on it. So very, very interesting idea to do some um, interdisciplinary and international comparisons. Thank yes, you. Lisa. I shall email you in between whiles. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. It's our pleasure to serve. Uh, you know, I, it's always any other a pleasure questions? to see you. <laughs> any other comments? So long, Jill. You know, I um, when you mentioned one of my good buddies uh, from Chicago, uh, coincidentally, Reverend Jackson. I was his um, 1984. I was his New Jersey, North Jersey spokesperson on his presidential bid. And coincidentally, I mentioned this in the context of the law school, and uh, I was also a volunteer with Shirley Chisholm's campaign uh, in the 1970s. Which means I stand next to Moses as an ancient figure here. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, uh, wow. well now, well, you sound excellent now. There's no static on your line. Really? I don't know. That's crazy. <laughs> of course, okay. that would happen. Are there any other comments from anyone? Any questions? Well, if not, on behalf of the um, Peter Scheim Academic Expo, I want to thank everyone uh, for participating today. And um, this is our fifth day of the um, of the expo offerings. This is our 25th anniversary. Um, We've also got um, Ana Campo Verde uh, scheduled to sp to speak. Still, I'm oh, pardon me, and, and and that's just my bad. You know, this is like my tenth program. Don't worry, Doctor Pritchett. I was right. gonna I was gonna stop you. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Anna. Yes. Go ahead. So really quickly, uh, I'm not a faculty, but I am an administrator of the university and I did my undergraduate and graduate to work, degree work um, at the university. So right now I lead the Latino Institute, um, which whose mission is to provide academic scholarships, professional development um, and cultural programming to students on campus. So really the larger theme of my chat today was going to be creating a sense of belonging for students um, and creating those inclusive spaces where they feel safe. So very high level um, 
Inclusion just means that everyone within the corporate structure, including students, faculty, administrators, and staff, feel that their perspectives are being valued and they have the resources and the support to thrive. So in terms of what happens when someone doesn't feel like that, a company, including higher education institutions, are able to hire diverse talent, but if they don't have the corporate culture that acknowledges and values different perspectives, then you know, what did you actually accomplish other than potentially putting forth some good numbers? Um, in terms of diversity and inclusion as a total, a company needs to hire diverse talent, but also needs to foster a culture that values, elevates, and support its, di its talent's diversity. So when it comes to students, um, when it comes to students, the, the Strategic Plans um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is led by Dr. Cooper Gibson um, and by Dr. Farina. So the DEI committee has a large responsibility to continue building an inclusive community based on mutual respect um, and appreciation while really taking a hard look at our current practices. Um, the DEI committee's work is being done by hundreds of faculty and student and administrators across campus. And I'd like to emphasize how important collaboration is, and it's really an undertone of everything that I'll be sharing with you today, um, especially in an, in an institution of higher education when you have so many experts across so many different disciplines. So what happens when students of color don't feel represented in their administrators, in their staff, or in their faculty, when they feel like they're the only ones you know, in the classroom, when they don't really see diversity in the guests that the university brings in, when you see leadership programs where your peers don't look like you, um, when you are given assignments and Professor Madelao, you kind of referenced this a little bit earlier in your in your speech. Um, but when you're given assignments that only represent one, you know, one perspective and one vision, um, they don't feel like they belong. And in my first year as director of the Latino Institute, I spent a lot of time listening to student feedback, including all the feedback I just delivered a little bit earlier, being the only one being called upon to represent your entire race, you know, during classroom discussions. Um, our team spent a lot of time developing surveys to gauge student interest um, and student engagement. Um, we worked with departments and student organizations across campus to build really relevant uh, programming and really meet students where they wanted they wanted to be met. So we built bridges across student organizations um, and we had incredibly we had a large amount of group discussions, including sometimes very difficult conversations. And we use each of these events to really learn more about the students, but then we have analytics behind it to help us um, to help inform our future programming and really help us identify where our gaps are and what students we haven't met with, what departments and organizations we have not worked with yet. We recently completed a Latino student survey at Seen Hall University, so we surveyed 1,300 self-identified Latinx students. We received 114 full responses, um, and we conducted 32 additional teledepth interviews. Um, and through this research that we found that 60% reported that they were not engaged on campus through any student organization, um, and we asked ourselves why. And I don't know the question or I don't know the answer yet um, because we still have a lot more research to do. But in our initial um, in our initial reviews of research that exists, there is um, studies suggest that students of color are more likely to be disengaged from their educational institutions when they do not feel like they belong. So really collaboration um, is a key insight and helping us find answers um, and partners to students and really increase their sense of belonging. Um, in 2020, between this entire academic year, we've had over a thousand students participate in about 14 to 20 events that the Latino Institute has hosted. And our team works very diligently to engage as many student organizations and student groups as possible. Um, another area of opportunity we identified was our alumni engagement so the latino institute has 15 years worth of alumni who are mostly disengaged who received a scholarship at some point um, so we identified two students or two two alumni excuse me who are now working on engaging um, the rest of the scholar cohort so that we can expand the network accessibility for our students of color um, whether it be through the Latino Institute or through any of the student organizations. So over the next couple of years, um, part of our goal is to implement data informed cultural programming, strengthen that programming, expand the availability of scholarships, 
um, and launch a mentorship professional development program, which we identified as a large source of need through our survey. So that's kind of like what's in the works for the Latino Institute itself. But in terms of the larger DEI strategy of CN Hall University, I think, you know, we're, we're as a university taking steps in the right direction. Um, but we, of course, have a long way to go. And I very much encourage everyone on this phone call to reach out and to collaborate with either departments or student organizations that you do not regularly collaborate with um, by including different perspectives. You open up various different conversations and you potentially are able to find students who very much open up about their struggles and can help you gain a lot more insight in how we as their administrators and their faculty can support them um, as they work towards completion of their degrees. That's all I got. No, that, oh, that, that, that was more than he says. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, that was a lot. Lot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but no, no, no. Thank you. Yeah. And I just put a little plug in the chat too for your collaboration with the library to expand uh, Latinx yes. recordings, and that really drew our attention to, you know, we were really um, deportate in that regard, and of course, part of its budget because the library never has enough collection development. So we really appreciate you putting money in towards that. But I'd extend that out to anybody. You know, if you're looking for library materials and you're noticing gaps, and you know, I've said this to people in the LGBT commu plus community as well, which is another area that suffers the same kind of lack of attention often. Um, you know, if you notice gaps, reach out to your librarians and say, hey, you know, we we have very, very few books in this area and this should be an area of focus on campus. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to do it right away because I said we never really have enough money, but I have wish lists just I'm waiting excellent. for the. I was going to say, as an addition to what Lisa is saying, so last year we were able to secure um, a grant from the Center of Hispanic Policy Research and Development to expand the library's offerings. We currently completed round one um, of our book purchasing, but rounds two and three are not yet complete. So if there's anyone on the call who has any wish list books or items, if you want to send them over to us, we can consider them into the books that still need to be purchased. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and Lisa, this is a question for this sort of, just for all of us. I'm just curious in this age of digital access and digital storage uh what is the interface between printed books and video sources oh forrest you have two hours <laughs> well, no. okay uh, well i'll take a sentence but, but no I, I, what i'm thinking about is uh for many of us we we could we visualize dvds but then you've got uh video streaming sources so when it comes to those type of visual collections, what does the library do today? Do, are you putting in DVDs or are there other sources that simply stream to the library? So how do we approach that? Yes, in general, for one thing with COVID, we pretty much suspended buying print books, obviously, while the library was closed. Right. And then for quite a period afterwards, simply because of, you know, the COVID. And we, we've resumed buying print books more or less on request, but generally we have a preference for ebooks, um, largely because a lot of students are still remote and oftentimes unwilling or simply unable to come to campus, so it's more equitable, although yeah. not all books are available as ebooks. We have several big streaming video collections. I'll pop it up in the chat. Thank you. Um, and again, you can request things. I should put the faculty request up in the chat. The big advantage of streaming video is that I'm sure you've all discovered if you try to do a DVD through Teams or even a, a, a streaming video that's you know available through one of the databases, it really doesn't work. It's both copyright and technical problems. So for example, you'll just get a blue screen mm. or you'll get the images and you won't get the sound or the sound is all distorted. There are so many problems. But with the streaming video, you can simply send the students the link and they can watch it either on their own time or individually in class. Right. So, you know, there's the advantage of being able to do the flipped classroom model there and you don't run into all these 
to my mind, ridiculous technical difficulties, which we shouldn't have in this day and age. Right. But unfortunately, you know, the the copyright holders do not like to make it easy for us to simultaneously show something to you know fifty students when they could force them to buy a copy everything. Okay. I'll, I'll put the link up for you. But great question. And yeah, one thing I'd be really interested in, and this is a whole nother discussion, but we could always engage it, is to what extent particularly students, but also faculty, um, prefer A, you know, online resources to print resources, and B, as, as you wisely mentioned, um, you know, visuals. I know streaming video is very popular because it, it it does visualize instead of just having to read. Me, I'm a huge fan of reading, but oftentimes the, the visual, I think, gives a more lasting knowledge. Certainly. And it takes us in our minds to places we may never get with our feet, so to speak. Well, well especially thanks. some traumatic types of things. I mean, as they say, you know, the picture speaks a thousand words, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm absolutely. thinking of the recent trials in particular. Thank you very much for the reminder of that. We thank everybody for your time, your talents, and sharing it with uh, the larger community. Um, just as an FYI, you know, we are, I believe, are recording this, which means that once it's posted, uh, you may access this forever and ever in that virtual world of YouTube. Okay. But uh, on the Seton Hall channel. So thank you all very much. And on behalf of the uh, Petersheim Committee and the commemoration of our 25th annual Petersheim Academic Expo, thank you all. And I would say good afternoon to everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>